Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with someone who brings great joy to knife junkies each year, June after June. Alicia Newton is the Blade Show director and as such is largely responsible for your experience uh, on your annual knife pilgrimage. And from what I've seen, she's doing a bang up job, but I have no idea how. And I mean, as someone who does a lot of reaching out and contacting the type, uh, that's a lot of knife makers and artisans to wrangle, especially for one weekend. Uh, so we'll meet Alicia and find out how she does it. But first, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And remember, you can always download the show to your favorite podcast app and listen to the show while you're doing the other things that you just have to do. And as always, join us on Patreon if you want more exclusive content including knife giveaways and other stuff. Uh, quickest way to get there is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Alicia, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I've uh, been wanting to talk to you now for two years, and then two years ago, things got in the way. Last year, I was busy trying to get myself to Blade, so finally, we get a chance to to catch up on, and uh, and talk. And as I was sitting, uh, looking at the uh, Blade Show website, it occurred to me, you're an event planner uh, by by uh, occupation and you could be planning a lot of different events um you're planning blade show and you've done so for five years now i think and no, actually since 2010 2010 oh my yes. gosh what yeah i don't know what i was reading i thought i saw 2018 2010 okay so 12 years uh that's that's even more amazing but you must have learned something about enthusiast communities in doing this. Uh, before I get into knives and blade show in particular, uh, what is it like planning such a giant event for uh, a, a group of individuals who are rabid about the given topic? You know, it's actually, um, this was kind of handed to me, like I said, back in 2010. And for the company that I was with before we moved over to new ownership, you know, we ran a, a host of events, upwards of 24 events for enthusiasts of all kinds. Um, but I can say by far, <laughs> the Blade Show was definitely the most passionate. So it did kind of fall into my lap, but it's actually been amazing to watch it grow, you know, again, from 2010 till 2022. You know, I've seen this show with just in a couple halls go to what it is now. Um, you know, I think in 2020, you mentioned that, you know, we were earmarked to do this in 2020 and then nothing happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. But sadly, you know, 2020 was on pace to probably be just amazing, record blowing, mind blowing um, in terms of attendance and everything else. And then we don't all need to go backwards to a negative space. But um, so, you know, being able to just watch the knife journey, the knife community, all the things that have come and gone over the years um, and the trends and the new people and just the passion around it. And, you know, you spoke about the passion earlier. Last year was the first time we had people actually line up on Wednesday for a show that opens on Friday. So it's, it's a privilege. It's a blessing. It's an honor to be a part of something that people love so much. Okay, so uh, I did notice a lot of people lined up, but that was my first Blade Show in 2021 was my first time. And I I was a little shocked by the throng of people. I mean, I knew there were going to be a lot of people, but I showed up and I was like, man, this is like a rock concert. <laughs> um, what what have you what have you noticed? What do you think it is about knives that has 
has this group so as you mentioned uh, uh enthusiastic rabid or passionate that's the word you used i think more than anything it there's two elements to it there's the custom element so it's the idea of owning something that nobody else has because you have so many things like i said with the makers that they make custom knives they're one of a kind but then i think even more so you have um, a lot of guys that are now being accepted in the industry that maybe don't make an exact knife, but they make um, EDC things or, you know, JRW gear. And I could go on and on about things that are unique and different that those types of guys bring to the table. Um, you also have the opportunity that a lot of these guys, their books are closed. You can't get a knife from them. So this is the one time that you have a chance that if you can get to their table first, you know, you don't have to put the order in, you get the opportunity to get that product first from them before anybody else. And I think finally we have knife makers um, that are really just pushing everything to the, you know, pushing the envelope when it comes to making a knife, trying so many things. And when you see that, that's, I think also what's, making people so excited about the opportunity to be the first one to get one of those because it's something new that maybe no one has done before. Uh, when I was there last year, I was uh, tickled to see people bolting for the Demco table um, both days to get a, he made a, they made a bunch of customs uh, that you just pretty much can't get. And then they also had the, the release of the AD 20.5. So people charged that table. And uh, I, I got to say, it, it made me um, it, it made me happy. You know, it, it's because <clears throat> I don't know, it is a very positive environment. And for someone like me, I have a I have a passion for all knives. I love historical knives. I, I love, um, you know, ethnographic weapons. I love modern EDC stuff, you know, everything. And you go into that, uh, those two halls at Blade Show, especially the main room, where there is such incredible variety. Uh, you know, I, I walked out with a tomahawk and several, you know, a lot of great stuff. Uh, but there were also um, people who had old Randalls displayed and old uh, slip joints and, and really it's very granular. Any any aspect of knife collecting, you can really go down the the hole there. How do you curate um, and choose who's there, and and how do you how does that work? You know, that's a great question. And the Blade Show, technically, this will be our forty first year with the star since we <laughs> since we missed twenty twenty. But um, you know, there is so much legacy that exists with that show a legacy that's meant to be celebrated. And I think you just brought up a really awesome point is that you do see so many, you know, knives that have been around and there's so much history to them and et cetera. But then you also get the guys that are, you know, up and coming and, and the guys that are hitting the ground running and are, those are the guys again, that are pushing the envelope. What can we do? What can we do different in knife making that hasn't been done yet? Always paying homage or respect to the guys that, that started this industry. And in terms of really how we curate it, I mean, we have guys that have been tending the blade show since it first started in, in Knoxville. I mean, that list, unfortunately is getting smaller, <laughs> but um, you know, we have really taken upon ourselves over the last couple of years to really vet the rest of the exhibitors that come in, you know, before anybody was allowed in and, and not saying that we don't welcome everyone, but we all know there's a lot of flea market knives out of there. And, mm -hmm. you know, being the Blade Show and being the Blade Magazine, we want to make sure that we do have the best product, the most representative product, and not junk or exhibitors that maybe are not, you know, the most up and up, if you will. <laughs> that's funny you say that because that's not something I noticed. Uh, all I noticed was that everything was amazing, that I could stop at any table. Uh, but now that you mention it, yeah, there was no, there were no gas station knives, as people mm -hmm. like to call them. Uh, there was, there was none of that. Everything was 100% serious. Uh, whether it's discovering 
some uh, maker who's toiling in obscurity and and uh, and buying one of their knives and and treasuring it, uh, or or going up to the Microtech, you know, not table, the Microtech, um, I don't know, sub community over there, um, and and the bigger the bigger displayers. I mean, obviously, uh, the big companies are are gonna are gonna be going in there. Uh, for knife makers, uh, for um, you know, custom knife makers and smaller makers, um, how, what's it like for them to um, become a part of Blade Show? Do they have to apply? Do they just have to buy a table? How does that work? Usually, if you're brand new, um, again, like we'll send you a, a request once you send us a request for the contract. We don't put the contract on the um, on the website anymore for that very purpose. So they send us, and really. In terms of vetting, it's we would never for Blade Show Atlanta. It's more about just making sure, like you truly are a knife maker. It doesn't have to be your full time job, but we just want to make sure you are in fact making knives or you have a knife related material. Um, you know, we've seen tons of grinding companies come up in the last couple of years. Um, materials for knife products. A lot of those companies um, are really. Um, becoming more relevant in the industry. And so really after we kind of vet to just make sure again, that you are in fact a knife maker, you have a legit knife product or a knife relevant product, then the contract pro process begins really. Um, but we, we try very much not to turn someone away. Again, trust me, we get the gutter companies, we get the, you know, popcorn companies we get you know the roofing companies we get all those type of guys too right. and obviously we're never going to do that but um you know in terms of the new guys too we once we get them on board obviously they have a lot of questions too so we try to help them a little bit in terms of you know guys you're gonna have to do more than just show up with some knives you know you're in a, you're Basically, we look at the blade show as the Super Bowl, if you will. So if you're a knife maker and you haven't really gone to even the regular season or let's say that AFC or NFC championships and you're coming straight to the Super Bowl, then you really are going to have to show up because you're competing with your products against 900 plus other exhibitors. So you really need to make sure you put your best foot forward. Yeah. And at any given moment, you can walk by any, even the the greatest of tables, the most together and um, you know branded or wh however you want to put it, and and there are moments of lag time, you know, where where people aren't at that place, and uh, um, sometimes you wonder, at, at you know, or or I did anyway, it being my first event, like are people gonna go by that guy, that poor guy, and then you come by later and there's a crowd. And and things seem to fluctuate, so that that's no um, no indication of quality or anything like that. Uh, but what is amazing to me are how many um, how many knife makers, like really excellent, legitimate knife makers, there are out there. Just in that um, that sort of pasture of tables, um, where where it's tables and not booths, and it's just maker after maker. It's it's staggering uh, how many people are doing this great work. It really is. And I think there's so many things to attribute that to. I think, you know, Forged of Fire has created obviously mm -hmm. a huge um, uptick probably in guys that have started making knives. And, you know, there are definitely a large percentage of guys that don't do this for full time. You know, they do this as a hobby. And um, and we, we love all of them, whether you're full time or hobbyist. But, um, you know, I think that that's been a huge help. Plus, I think there's just this amazing sharing of knowledge in this community. And I use the word community because I think that really is the best way to describe it. This is a community. And even though the person at table 21B is competing for the same dollars as the person at 21C, um, you know, at the end of the day, this is still a community. And the fact that everyone's worth, um, I'm sorry, not worth, but willing to share information that continues to help this industry grow and bringing up, you know, young knife makers, you know, we start to see 17 and 18 year olds and we have yeah. a couple of those at the show this year. 
And that's super exciting. It is amazing to see. And, and I also like, um, I also appreciate the popularity and the sort of normalizing that uh, Forged in Fire has brought kind of to the mainstream. And uh, now more and more, I mean, I have a theory that, that uh, the love of knives goes all the way, you know, down to our genes. It was our earliest mm -hmm. tool and, uh, and, and, the, and our, you know, that in fire was how we survived from the, from the earliest of, uh, of our history. And so to me, I believe that this love is, is in all of us, maybe dormant in some, uh, but but you get them in that environment and um, and kind of normalize it and people are allowed to like it. You know what I'm saying? Um, you're talking about Blade magazine. Obviously, Blade show was born out of Blade magazine. Tell me a little bit about that and and about the magazine itself. What what differentiates Blade? There seems to be something. But what different differentiates Blade from the rest of the knife magazines? Um. Well, and I will I will be straight up honest. <laughs> I obviously work hand in hand with the team from the Blade magazine. I think, and you are correct. The Blade show started back in you know 1982, um, and it obviously was created because of the Blade magazine. And as far as Blade magazine itself, I think the one thing that really helps it separate it from everything else is not only the content and I, I never want to say anything else about any competitors, or anything like that, because everybody's doing their own thing. But what blade magazine has brought to the table is, you know, the blade magazine hall of fame, the blade magazine custom awards, the blade magazine knife of the year awards, and those things have become, you know, highly coveted over the years. Um, and it's an honor to receive one of those things. So not even just the content itself. Um, and I think another thing, you know, Steve Shackelford has been at the helm of that magazine for 30 plus years. I mean, he is a vault of information, way more than I could ever be. Um, and has probably watched this industry evolve over the years more than most of us have. So, um, you know, when you have that legacy at your fingertips, that really lends itself as well to the magazine. And I think it's become respected uh, in the industry. When people see the name Blade, it just comes with, oh, wow, that's probably going to be a great magazine or that's going to be a great show. Uh, well, you, you also said it, uh, I thought pretty well when you, you said all the other magazines, they're doing their thing and, and there are niche magazines. Blade seems to be the final voice. Is that the right term? The, the final word, you know, um, uh, you can open up Blade and see something about and, an, uh, you know, a classic maker. And then mm -hmm. you can see the newest OEM manufactured young American designer, uh, you know, all in the same pages, uh, all in the same magazine, which to me makes it kind of the overall um, I don't know how to put it, but uh, maybe the overall authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go to the Blade show itself and you see, well, yeah, that's that's being borne out in real time here because you can get anything under the sun uh, that's got a blade on it. Right. Right. And I think the one thing that sets Blade show probably apart from any other show, too, is the international. I mean, we are so mm -hmm. excited for 2022 to welcome back our international friends. I mean, we haven't seen most of these guys since 2019. Wow. So we are over the moon excited to welcome these guys back to see friendly faces. Um, I know so many of these guys are excited to be back too. Um, so I think that's another element. You know, we have all 26 countries represented wow. that will be at Blade Show. And um, that's a big number. That's a lot of countries. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, man, I didn't, I don't even, I couldn't even begin, you know, past five, what, what those other countries might be. <laughs> I um, could probably rattle them off, but it would take me longer than the <laughs> podcast. So. so in terms of the trends, you, you said you've seen a lot of trends coming and going and that kind of the ebb and flow of that. Uh, what do you see right now as the uh, predominant trends that drive people a to, to to the blade show and what, what are people asking for you know that's that is always the loaded question and 
it's tough for me to answer that because, you know, we just finished Blade Show Texas and, mm. you know, it was interesting to um, ask the guys kind of, you know, the same thing. These guys spent the night, they ran into the room the first thing. And I just was kind of asking them, you know, what are you, what are you running into? And, and I, I won't go into that, but I, I don't know so much that it's trends, but it's who well, I go back to who's trying something different, mm-hmm. who's pushing the envelope, who's, you know, using different technology. Um, and then quite honestly, some of the trends, I don't know if it's even the word trends is correct, but who's really done a great job of fostering their own fan group, their own um, group of followers, their own private group that, you know, you may not make the greatest knife, um, but you've done a great job of fostering your community and everybody wants to feel a part of that. And those are also a lot of the guys that you see people running into. They've fostered an amazing community and that's who these guys are running in to see and get a product from. That is so true in terms of, um, I'm sure it's happened with all of us where, uh, you know, I'm thinking of one person in particular who I will not name. And I actually really like his work, but I'm shocked at what people are willing to pay for it. And and it's mm-hmm. that there's a mystique around this guy and there is a, um, you know, uh, and, and that's part of it. You know, that pride of ownership you were talking about before with getting a custom knife. That's part of it. It's like, oh, well, I know this guy, you know, and, you know, he doesn't know a lot of people, but I I'm in with him and I have one of his knives. And exactly. And and that's you know, that's so much what it is. You know, we just did a great um, project with Ernie Emerson and, yeah. you know, he does a big lottery in Atlanta and his he uh, you know, his his lotteries are very, very big. They're very successful. And it was super awesome to work with him on this project, you know, on a Blade Show exclusive for a knife that he brought back out of retirement. But yet he took the time to, you know, hand grind each one, hand sign each one. And, you know, his, you know, we just did 25 knives, but they sold in 24 hours (laughs) because again, you have an Ernie Emerson, he's behind it, but he also put a lot of time in it and made it special. And those guys that are Ernie Emerson fans, pretty much whatever he touches, they want a part of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw his video. Um, he put it, I'm a huge Ernest Emerson fan mm-hmm. and I love him and his designs. I think he's a great guy and I love his designs always have. Uh, and so, uh, but I have no customs. I have no, none of the high end Emerson stuff. And, um, uh, much to my dismay, I saw him put out the video. That it's the CQC 13, mm-hmm. and, which mm-hmm. is probably my all time favorite yes. uh, all around Emerson design. It's his, it, I think it was his first Bowie, maybe. Uh, yes. He's done a lot of Bowies, but uh, that one. Mm, and when I saw that it, it's the, the Blade Show exclusive, uh, it was really exciting because I know every year there are certain companies that you can expect to do the exclusive. And that is also cool because people who collect those can mark time and remember their times mm-hmm. each year of blade show with those. But this exclusive special uh, run was uh, made me especially envious. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can't say enough great things about um, Ernie. He has been a longtime supporter fan of the blade show. And he was just, he was super honored um, to work on this with us. And we're thinking, no, we're super honored to work with you on this. So there was a lot of honor going around, but (laughs) it it was a great, you know, it was a great product and and a great project to work on with him on that. So, um, you know, those are, again, those are other kind of perks, if you will, of my job. It's just the opportunity to just work with amazing people. This really is just a great community of people. And they're just so passionate about what they do. And that passion so infectious and you just want to be a part of it. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you use the word community. The word community gets used a, a lot for the knife world. Um, and I tend to be a little bit uh, guarded in my language sometimes. I, I'm sure Jim is laughing backstage. But uh, I, uh, the word community, I don't say lightly. I don't use that term in particular 
lightly, but I, I think in the knife community, and, and the reason I say that is because I've never, you know, until last year, I'd never met anyone and shaken their hand in person, you know? Right. So how, how can it be a community if I've never, but this is, this is modernity. And, uh, but the knife community is, you know, with, with very few exceptions, just so full of respect and, and mutual admiration and all that. And, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it really deserves the term, but we were talking about, uh, Ernest Emerson for a second and something that he really embodies, uh, something that I will always remember him for is innovation, uh, you know, mm -hmm. innovating the wave a feature, um, quite by accident, but he saw, he saw how the accident was valuable and, and, uh, you know, capitalized on it. Uh, blade show is something, you know, we've been, we cover it on this show. Uh, you know, we have for three years now and, um, the thing that always strikes me are the awards and uh, the emphasis on innovation, even in the even in the awards that are not uh, o overtly about innovation. You see this spirit of newness and uh, um, in the awards. Uh, tell me a little bit about how those come, how those are decided on and how the awards work. So. Um and I can't reveal all the secrets because oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there are obviously very um, for both the factory and the custom awards. There is a very um, what's the best word? Um, oh, gosh. Of course, now is when it, um, obviously well versed in the world of knife making, but also educated about knives. Um, and a panel of judges that are more than experienced, probably have more experience with, with all their years combined than you and I are old together in terms of age. So, right. um, and then there's, you know, I have never sat in the room just because obviously I have, have other things to do, but um, I know for a fact that a one of our exhibitors in Texas was asked to help judge and he had said what an honor it was to be in that room and really watch everything that goes into the decision for the knives that have won. And he was blown away. So again, having never been in the room, just from a timing standpoint of me not having the time to be in there, it's not just, you know, a couple guys milling around and there's a lot of process that goes into it that, and everybody that looks at these awards, chooses these awards. And I believe we have um, 13 for the factory side and about 20, 22 or so for the custom side. So, And do they, do the makers or manufacturers submit a knife for consideration or yes. do you troll around and, oh, that's. Cool. Oh, absolutely. Okay. No, that would be impossible to do. <laughs> okay, that's no, they, they are sent information in advance. Matter of fact, they just received it this week. Hmm. Everything is done on site though. So um, on Friday, all those that wish to enter the custom awards, they bring their knives to a room. They choose the category that they wish to enter their knife in. And then for the factory awards, those knives are all, um, if you've been to the Blade Show, there's a huge Knife of the Year display award in the middle of the lobby. And the factory guys, same thing. They go and put their knives on display in there. And then they're judged accordingly um, for those guys that choose to enter their knives. What, uh, what brought about um, the... Texas and the Blade Show West shows. You mentioned those uh, just earlier, and while we're while we're talking about these awards, I'm wondering, well, are there awards for those shows too? And then and then it just got me wondering, how did those come about? Uh, there must be so much demand uh, that we got to stick one in the middle of the country and one on the other end. Well, so Blade Show West we launched in 2018. There used to be a Blade Show back in the early 2000s um, when once I kind of was hand of Blade Show. I did stop that one in 2010 um, simply from a standpoint of it, you know, there didn't seem to be any return on the investment there. Mm -hmm. So we kind of tabled it for a year and a couple of, obviously several years. And meanwhile, Blade Show Atlanta was really growing. And then um, 2018 presented that opportunity where we really started to realize that when we took a, 
a quick look at the demographics of people attending Blade Show. Um, <clears throat> even though it's as large as it is, there's still a huge population that does not come from the Pacific Northwest, from the West mm -hmm. Coast, from any of that area. And for obvious reasons. I mean, it's very expensive, you know, to fly, to stay at a hotel, to do all those things. So it made sense for us to um, move and do a, an event. And long story short, we obviously started in Portland, but then COVID came and then that ended that run. We went to California last year, but that came with its own challenges. And again, COVID, some other things. So, and without getting too down in the, in the roots, People don't understand. It does take a long time for us to get space in a facility. We can't just call up a venue and be like, hey, we want to come have a show. Right. So with COVID and everything else, it did actually kind of work in our favor. And we were finally able to secure space in Salt Lake City, which we're beyond excited about, beyond elated. We are very optimistic that we've finally found our permanent home with Salt Lake being a knife friendly state. Oh, yeah. very outdoors, um, really in line with what we as an industry subscribe to. Um, and then in terms of Texas, it was just an opportunity that fell into our lamp, lap with the former owner of the ICCE show and was kind of ready to say, hey, listen, this event stuff is it's a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> so um, they handed it over to us and we kept it as ICCE in 2021. But then we threw the Blade Show name behind it. And um, and now it's Blade Show Texas, as we all know it. And um, it, it definitely is going to be one that people will continue to keep talking about. So Blade Show Texas and Blade Show West in Salt Lake in Utah, uh, very, um, as you mentioned, knife-friendly states, mm -hmm. uh, especially Utah. Um, but so was it really, I mean, we all kind of know about California and its various foibles uh, for being such a beautiful place and, and, know. Every, and, and everything else. You know, it's got some other, it's got, it's got its other issues. Uh, yes. So is it difficult? Was it difficult? I'm, I'm assuming it was, that's why you left. But I mean, it must've been a serious pain to work there because I mean, how much of what was being sold or what was being featured there was actually legal there, you know? Yeah. And that was one of the obstacles and, and you're exactly right. I mean, as someone that, you know, throws massive events, there's a lot of variables that we look at when we are looking at a venue, obviously we want to look at our demographics. Um, California is a, is a huge state with a, it's which a lot of money for knives. A lot of people interested in knives there. Um, yes, we were aware that we were going to experience some um, fallout with kind of the autos and, and the ballet songs. And we kind of worked around that a little bit, but um, you know, then, then there's a side of, we won't bring politics into this, but then there was a side for us in 2021 of just the whole, then it became the vaccination requirement. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. then, but you'll have to laugh literally two weeks before the show, they told us that when people come in through the metal detectors and I laughed and I said, I'm sorry, what? I said, you know what metal detectors check for? This is a knife show. <laughs> Oh my god. Probably something you should have told us when we were looking at the venue as an option. So again, just another hurdle that we had to overcome. And you know, when you're running these events, you're trying to eliminate as many hurdles as possible. And sure. Long Beach, other other than that, Long Beach had everything you want. A perfect venue, didn't need a car. You're on the beach, you can walk everywhere. The hotel's connected to the convention center. It was beautiful, but those variables did not outweigh the other variables. So, so were you able to convince them to scrap the metal detectors? I mean, yeah, we still the had them, but craziest... I convinced them to let people bring knives in. So, yeah, it's like, what are you checking yeah. for now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, so, man. yeah, so you know, we get feedback all the time. Why don't you go to this venue? Why don't you go to this venue? And again, there's just a lack of knowledge that people don't understand that prior to COVID, venues booked years in advance. I mean, we're booked in Atlanta through 2025 right now. 
-hmm. Like, were yeah. our spaces booked through 2025? Um, Texas, we're working on our contract for 24 and 25 right now. So once you kind of get in somewhere, you tend not to let go of the space. And so it was just a matter of us being in a position to finally get the facility, get the city that we wanted and everything line up. So we are, again, super excited about Salt Lake City this year. So Blade Show has more to offer than just uh, um, exhibitors and opportunities to buy and meet. Uh, you know, actually, that's that was the greatest thing to me were, were the people. And I know a lot of people are going to say that. A lot of people say that. The best thing about Blade Show is the people. And it's true. Um, the very, very, very close second are all the awesome knives. But it's great to meet people shake hands, be introduced to people. Um, I bumped into someone who was, um, uh, who, who was commissioned by my parents to make me my, my 50th birthday knife. It was a big deal. And I was really excited. And I bumped into them there, him there hunting for stag for my, for my handle. Oh my gosh. And, and it was just the coolest thing. I'm like, Oh my God, how you doing? You know, and he showed me the, the piece. So I got to see it before it was transformed into a, 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 loveless sub hilt fighter handle which was so awesome uh but a lot lot more than just the meeting the people and the things and the and the knives you can buy there are events and you do seminars like we're talking about emerson i saw a great seminar he put on last year mm -hmm. uh um, about being a man in in the modern day and the challenges and um it was great. I loved all of the ancillary stuff. What What are the other events and kind of things that people can take advantage of while they're there? And, you know, the biggest thing that we have gotten to, Bob, about the Blade Show is it's not a show. We actually refer to it now as an experience. Um, I think that's why you're seeing more and more people buy the three-day pass. It's literally the best value for your money because... You can't do Blade Show in one day. Um, you're not doing yourself justice. And we understand that there's things in people's life that allow them to only come for one day. But, you know, you're right. We have the demos um, on Friday and Saturday. We have Blade University classes. You know, you really have an opportunity to sit in a classroom and, and learn from some of the top, you know, guys in their field. And you basically are paying $25 to sit there and have one-on-one -on -one interaction, um, you know, for an hour with these guys. So there's that element. And then you have the ballet song competitions, yeah. which has become a huge part of this show. Um, and then you have the blade sports cutting competition, which we are excited is finally we'll be back this year. They did a non-title cutting championship last year. Okay. Um, but now that everything is back underway again, they'll be back to their regular cutting championship format. Um, so, you know, there's just, there's something for everyone. Um, we're excited. We have some women only focused stuff. I oh, think cool. that obviously people, when they hear knife making, they do associate a lot of men only, but there's a lot of brilliant, brilliant, um, up and coming knife makers, veteran knife makers, Veronique, they're not, you know, Grace Horn, Laura Schwartzer, and then you have Abby Lyons and Haley DeRocher, Tiger mm -hmm. Lily Knight. And I mean, I could go on and on. And, you know, I think it's really cool to see these women. And, you know, we want to do a panel this year um, to get more women excited about knife making. I love that. I love hearing that. Um, I just, <laughs> You know, well, I'm married to a, she's not, she's along for the ride. She likes knives. We met doing martial arts. She likes, she likes the use of knives. Right. And, and she's enjoyed, uh, you know, living with someone who's been down the rabbit hole with it. Uh, but uh, I've also worked with other women who like knives and we've had a few women on this show, but I think it's uh, just knowing uh, I, I, I am also in production, way different scale than you, though. Um, and working with women in that uh, line of work, I see the attention to detail. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't care what anyone says. There is a difference. And I'm not saying that uh, that men don't have attention to detail. I know they do. Um, and, and men tend to love things. 
and tend to spend special attention to details on things rather than events or people or so what I'm trying to get at is it's exciting to hear about a lot of uh, women coming up in knife making uh, because it will be interesting to see how um, how that attention to detail gets translated into mm -hmm. into this craft I love. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I was thinking when you said that jokingly, that's why a woman runs the blade show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> man. Many men have a trident <laughs> and you're right. Their attention to detail is, is different than what a woman's attention to detail is. Oh <laughs> man. I, I think they were wise to hire you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, it's a labor. It's definitely a labor of love, but I mean, I, I've said it all and I've said it before, and I know we use the word community a lot, but I can honestly say for me, it's it's family now, you know, and it's, um, I have forged, no pun intended, some amazing relationships from this job over the past 14 years that, you know, these people are are in my life and, and outside of the Blade Show and that's just such a blessing because again, they're just such amazing people. And, you know, one of the greatest joys is I'm able to, you know, when I either go to another knife show that I'm not running or even at my own show, um, you know, when I could get a chance to introduce a knife maker to maybe a sheath maker mm -hmm. and they haven't met, but I get to put the two of those guys in touch. And now they're like, Oh, awesome. Actually, I'm looking for this sheath. Could you make it for me? And or a material handles guy, you know, oh, have you not met this guy? He, he has amazing material handles um, or handle materials. You know, those are things that I love to do, too. And that is just another, again, perk or benefit of this job. It's like being a professional Yenta, you know, uh, uh, getting people together and and uh, or a matchmaker <laughs> or a matchmaker. Yeah. Yeah. Just getting them exposed to to you know, one, one person to another, that's, that's the perfect. And that feels good for you. I'm sure just to forge those, those connections, you know, mm -hmm. um, maker to maker to maker, maker to, I mean, cause that's what people are going there for. It's kind of like, uh, 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 it's kind of like, um, uh, Sundance back in the day, people would make mm -hmm. their independent films, go to Sundance and hope to meet Harvey Weinstein, you know, heaven mm -hmm. forbid now, but, uh, you know, that's kind of, how the blade show works. So uh, like up front, I was talking about how uh, difficult it must be um, organizing something like this on this giant scale. And then I also alluded to the fact that you're um, you're dealing with people, you're uh, the people you're working with and bringing into the show are all artisans and knife makers and, and a, a, a lot of them anyway are, are, the type who spend a lot of time in their shop and a lot of time working and thinking about their work and maybe not as much time on administrative stuff or, um, you know, on, on practical matters because they're more artist types. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, do you find that, uh, I know it's been a while because you've been doing blade show for 14 years, but do you find that working with the people who are actually occupying the show, uh, for Blade Show is work is different than working in the kind of stuff you were doing before. Yes. And um, you know, well, prior to my this job, I was in PR and marketing for years and years and years. Ironically, I came from the ski and snowboard industry, and um, there's a lot of similarities in terms of how those operate. Um again, this a community, because that's a big community in its own right. Um, so there was a part of me that was sad when I had to leave that because I moved and I thought, gosh, I'm never going to find that again. But yet here I am. Um, but yes, you have to be accepting of the fact that 75, well, 70, 75% of our exhibitor base are not guys that sit in front of computers. Right. Um, they're not guys that respond quickly. Um, and as is such, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time kind of getting that formula of, you know, what time of the year do I start sending information out? 
Um, how much time lead time do I give these guys? But I would be lying if I did not say that I spend the better part of two weeks before the show literally chasing down <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these guys to, you know, get those last minute I's dotted and T's crossed. Um, but it's OK. I've accepted that because, again, these are not guys that are sitting behind computers. And I respect that they're in their shops. They're working. Yeah. They're working at doing what they need to do to get ready for Blade. Um, and I need one, you know, one tiny little last minute thing from them. But, you know, they're trying to get everything ready, too. So right, right. With that comes a lot of patience. <laughs> oh, man, I bet. I bet because. You know, you need what you need and they've got knives mm -hmm. to make. And, you know, one thing's important to you. One thing's important to the other person. Uh, so this event, this giant event, how does it impact the community in, well, in Atlanta is where we're talking right now. Like, what have you seen? How do you see the, the, uh, and I'm not talking about the knife community. I mean, Atlanta itself, you know, you, you come in here for a weekend. I'm sure it's a whole week of setup and breakdown and all that stuff, but you kind of descend on the city in that mm -hmm. area. All these knife people come and it's this amazing uh, weekend. And then, and then it disperses. Do you, do you have any idea what kind of an impact that has on the, on the city? I can't necessarily say economic impact. I mean, I can, you know, we obviously have about 14 hotels blocked, but I can tell you, um, you know, we've been doing this show at the Cog Galleria for 26 years. Um, we work hand in hand, hand in hand with the Cobb tourism. Um, and they have gone out of their way, rolled out the red carpet to, to work with us because they realize the economic impact, obviously that we have. And then, um, the Waverly Hotel, which is the home of the pit that everybody knows so well, um, it it would be not far pressed for me to say that that weekend at that hotel is by far the biggest spend probably of their entire year, just mm -hmm. in the bar bill. Alone. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have the entire hotel now, which has been great. Um, so, but really in terms of food and alcohol, we're the biggest spend. There's obviously other events that come into Atlanta that are bigger than ours. Uh, Comic-Con. Um, uh, it's, I can't think of what it is. The anime. Anime. So those are actually bigger in terms of physical people coming. You know, those, those events get upwards of 40,000 people um, throughout the weekend. But those are also not big, you know, money spenders. <laughs> right, right. Like our guys are. So we definitely have an economic impact. But the Waverly, we have heard stories where people work at other Marriott properties and have actually asked to come work at the Waverly that weekend of our show because they love it so much. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, tell people if they don't know what the pit is, what's the pit? So the pit kind of organically started um, years and years and years ago because obviously peach pit um, and the shape of the hotel itself. Um, and it is where everybody now goes after dinner to just go down and have a beer, have a drink, have a soda, whatever your choice is. And you will see, you know, Friday and Saturday easily upwards of, you know, 2000 people down there. And I think it's an opportunity for, again, I wouldn't say any knife maker considers himself a celebrity, a, you know, a prima donna or any of that. But for some people getting a chance, like you said, if you got a chance to go down and share a beer with Ernie Emerson. <laughs> yeah you would probably take that opportunity. And so it really gives an opportunity for all the attendees that come to the show, maybe to sit down and grab a beer and have a chat with one of their favorite knife makers. And they can't do that during the show because that's business hours. Um, and so it's really just grown and grown and grown over the years. And, you know, we finally decided in 2021 to um, do all of our awards right down there in the pit so that everybody can see uh, that so chooses 
can see who's won the awards and all that stuff. So that was a huge success last year. Yeah, because of that space, that mm -hmm. <clears throat> that wide open space, you can you can be anywhere and and see what's going on uh, from there. Uh, the um, oh, what was I going to say about the pit? Oh, uh, well, I I had a great time. I went to the pit one night. I was there for for three nights. Uh, no, I went I went two nights, but stayed late one night. Anyway, it doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> but the point is, to me, yeah, they are celebrities, and and uh, and. Uh, it reminds me of when I met um, Les George for the first time uh. um, doing this podcast. I was like, oh, Mr. George, you know, I really love your work. And uh, sorry if I'm stammering. I'm a little starstruck. And he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, he's like, um, OK, here's the least famous pro bowler. And here's the most famous knife maker. So get over it. I was like, OK, <laughs> we just yeah. we had a great conversation, but it was a funny it was just a funny thing because to me, I, you know, I see these, these guys, you know, bumped into Michael Janich. Wow. It's so cool to see you in mm -hmm. person. You know, they are my celebrities, you know, I'm not, I don't care what the rock does or what, what the starlets do. I care what's happening in the knife world, you know? Right. And I think office also, it's an opportunity for the knife maker to connect with, you know, their, their, the people that are buying their knives and maybe get to spend a little bit more time with them too, because I mean, let's be real. The day that people quit buying knives, you know, this mm -hmm. this this beautiful thing that we all get to be a part of comes to a screeching halt. So I think, you know, that pit just creates that really that opportunity where now everyone's on the same playing field. Everyone's on, on the same level and you're just sitting there drinking a beer with your buddy and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, as we wrap up here, I just want to ask you um, for some advice that you might give to knife makers or budding knife companies, anyone who hasn't presented or shown at Blade Show, um, but is thinking about it, say next year or in the offing, what would you tell them to, to, to do how to prepare? Okay. So there's the, my answer is going to be two pronged in that. I would first speak to maybe guys that this will be their very first blade show. And the best advice I can give you is don't sit in your chair. <laughs> don't be on your phone. Make sure that you stand up behind your table, engage people when they walk by. Every single maker needs to remember someone may have come to your table. They may have chatted with you. They may not have bought a knife from you. But three months down the road, they may be like, oh, I really want to go back and get, you know, Bob Smith's knife or what's he got now. So while you may not have made the sale that day, you never know what relationship you're going to create. You never know what's going to come. So, you know, I've seen the downfall of so many makers saying, well, I had a terrible show. I didn't sell anything. And my first thought is. You sat behind your table. You didn't engage. You were on your phone. You didn't make on eye contact. Those are so important. And that can really make or break a show for you. Um, and in terms of people wanting to come to the Blade Show, um, we never ask how many shows have you done before. But I would, I have actually talked to people before who said, this is going to be my first show. I'm not really sure if I should come. I really encourage them just to come and attend first. Mm -hmm. Come and see the show. See what it's about. See what people are doing. And then maybe go to some a couple of local shows. Get an understanding for what people are looking for. And then come to the Blade Show. It, it really is difficult if you're trying to come to the Blade Show for your first show. Again, you're in a room with, you know, 950 other exhibitors. And it's going to be tough if you don't have something or you don't have the personality that's going to let you set yourself apart from everybody else. Yeah, that that what you said about standing up and engaging and eye contact is is such a big deal because, um, you know, uh, I've heard this many, many times from from uh, custom collectors that after the first knife, it, it, it almost becomes more about the relationship with that maker mm -hmm. than their knives. So yeah, that is very important. Um, and, and I like your, I like your thought of just literally standing up 
you know, and, and because when you stand also, you know, in, in turn, you feel more confident when you're mm -hmm. standing and when you're sitting and people are above you and looming, you know, so I, I think, and, and, and your comment about people walking around, you don't, you know, you, you could blow all your money in the first 20 feet of that place. Mm -hmm. You know why? So people are going to be walking. They're going to be saying, I'll be back. And, and then the makers are like, oh, probably not, but you know, we'll see. And uh, some people are serious about it. Some people aren't. But yeah, you got to, you know, you've spent all this time on this craft and making this thing. So put in a little bit of that other effort. And it's it's uncomfortable for some people to be sociable like that. But that is a, a part of that recipe. You do have to sell the knife. Right, right. And like I said, you know, it just depends on your your attitude. If If you look at Blade Show as a networking opportunity, an opportunity to meet other knife makers, to hone your craft, then Blade Show will be great for you. But if you're just looking to come in and you didn't sell any of your knives and it was a waste of your time, then you probably won't be back. But that probably is not on us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lastly, uh, people who are planning on attending um, mm -hmm. or want to attend for the first time, just give a quick rundown. Best way to get tickets, best deal on tickets. And uh, you said you have a block of hotels. Yes. So obviously our website, bladeshow.com, has a wealth of information. Um, we always encourage people to go there because we have all, you know, frequently asked questions that people ask that we've gotten over the years. So, you know, check there first. The ticket link is right there. Obviously, all the early bird tickets are completely sold out. Um and for people that think that they will last longer than the first three weeks when we put them on sale, they do not. Um, we do have a travel section. If you still need to get a hotel room, we have reduced rates at a lot of hotels in the area. So I think at this point in time, everybody's looking for a way to save a buck. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can only come for a day, great. But if you can come for the weekend, um, you will definitely get your money's worth. It's the best bang for your buck. A three-day pass is $65. Oh. So not only do you get, you know, all the knife shopping in the world, but you get the free demos and the ballet competition and the cutting championships and the pit and just everything else. So it really is the best bang for your buck. <laughs> Yeah. And that first day is reconnaissance. You're just walking yes. around <laughs> looking at what you want. You're like a deer in headlights. And unless you are, and listen, let's be real. The early birds, the diehards, they are going in early because they're looking for a specific knife. Yeah. Um, and they're going to get that. So for everybody else that's coming in, you will not walk away from Blade Show and say, I didn't find anything I wanted. Because if you do, then you're probably not a knife person. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I think you're right. Friday, for those of you that are just coming in to just kind of take it all in, walk around, see everything, see what's out there, and then start to to go back. Yeah, and and meet those meet those knife makers mm -hmm. and introduce yourself and and start relationships with some of these people. And man, get your knives at Blade Show. Alicia, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was a pleasure meeting you and finding out a little bit about what must go into this immense job. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the the time and the opportunity to talk about obviously something I love so much. So, you know, I look forward to seeing everybody. I look forward to meeting you Yeah, um, nice. this year finally. And um, just thanks for the time and for the support of the show. We appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Take care. All right, thanks. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. All right, so that conversation just got me ridiculously excited yet again today uh, for Blade Show. I cannot wait. Um, and a big part of that is the people, as I mentioned. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I cannot wait. And, of course, we'll be doing a show from there like we did last year. Uh, so uh, be sure to join us next Sunday for another interview and, of course, Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental, where you get to see some new stuff, uh, new knives coming out. And then Thursday night uh, live, Thursday night knives live right here on YouTube, Facebook and Twitch. Uh, join us tomorrow night for that. 
Uh, well, I guess it's not tomorrow night when you're listening. Do excuse me. Also, check us out on the podcast apps uh, right to the right of my face. And until next time, uh, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.